<clears throat> Hello and welcome to this first episode in a series of three workshops um, where Sia, Caramelagos um, and I, but mostly really only Sia, will be, um, <laughs> will be building out uh, uh, an e-commerce store end-to-end -end, uh, using uh, Eleventy, Stripe, and Netlify serverless functions. Um, hello to everybody out there. My name is Matt Ling. I am a developer advocate at Stripe, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by Sia Caramelagos. Um, Sia is an artist, um, writer, web developer, Lego builder, <laughs> dog <laughs> owner, um, and so the real deal multi talent. So please, please, Sia, like say, say hi. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm really excited to be here today and to show you our little project. Um, it's going to be great. You can find out more information about me on SIA.codes. I write a lot of stuff for Jamstack, Eleventy, and web performance. And um, I'm pretty active on Twitter, so you can follow me on the Green Greek right there. And then um, we'll be sure to drop links to when um, we have some content that's related. But I'm excited to get started. Yeah, yeah, super cool. So um, I think, Sia, uh, would it make sense for you to maybe demo out the project or what what you're going to build out, like kind of give a bit of a get a, a bit, an idea of what's going to happen? Sure, yeah, let's do that. So let me share one of these. I believe it's going to be this. Yep. Oh, it looks reddish to me. Is it fine for y'all? It's fine for me. I had that yesterday where my slides were like salmon pink for some reason, but Weird. I think it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on YouTube it looks fine. <laughs> funny. Um, sure. Yeah. So I am a developer, but I also have a lot of side hobbies. And um, for years, I've kind of sold crochet patterns and um, coloring pages and digital downloads on Etsy and some other sites. And I always wanted to self host those because I'm a big fan of the indie web. But also, I don't necessarily get enough volume to um, pay for like some $20 a month um, e commerce fees, for example. And so I've always wanted to build something that was as low cost as possible. That's a shop. So that's kind of where the motivation came for this and the background. So I have this other website called Sia.studio. And um, there is a shop now. And this is a shop we're going to build out. And it has a bunch of coloring pages on it. So what I can do is um, click buy now. And that goes into Stripe Checkout, which I haven't branded yet. We are going to brand this a bit more as well. And you would go through the payment process. And then after that, you actually get an email receipt from Stripe and then another email that contains the digital download link that expires within a week. And that download link is unique. And um, yeah, it expires in a week so that I can kind of protect my source files from like ongoing downloads. So yeah, that's that's the summary of what we're going to build. Really cool. OK, so maybe I can take a moment um, and just uh, go over a, a very short overview of um, of this series. So again, we're going to try and chunk it up into like three uh, phases, three episodes. Episode one, what you're watching now. Um, so like when you're building a business um, online or bringing a business online, um, you know, you're, you're gonna, there's obviously going to be a lot to think about, but certainly these three things you're definitely going to want to think about. Um, firstly, is like managing your product catalog, right? So you're going to want to, uh, you know, somewhere to like um, to, to, to create your products and your prices. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and what, what C is going to show is like how she managed her products um, in the Stripe dashboard and then also use the API to retrieve that product, product information to like build it into her website. Um, secondly, um, you'll need a, a checkout flow, right? So you're going to need to give your customers a way for them to give you their payment information. So you could do anything from like a really uh, simple no code payment links integration where you just bang a link onto a page or send it by an email and uh, somebody clicks on that link and lands in, in, in checkout. Or you could build a uh, like a custom element, a custom checkout flow using elements in Stripe JS. But in, I think in this uh, in this case, uh, we're going to use um, checkout and let checkout do all of the heavy lifting for us, right? So that means being PCI compliant, um, uh, optimized for mobile and desktop and, and every other screen size, and uh, taking taking care of like digital wallets and all of the different local payment methods and uh, and automatic payment methods now uh, that you can that you can leverage through through Stripe uh, through checkout and the dashboard. And then finally, of course, once you're receiving your payments, um, 
you know, you'll want a, a way to uh, uh, know, first know that you got paid and then, uh, of course, to fulfill those orders, right? So in the final episode, we'll build out, um, or uh, see, so it's going to build out a Netlify serverless function uh, with a webhook endpoint and that it's going to listen uh, for, for uh, payment notification events um, and then and then go ahead and fulfill those orders. So that's kind of an like overview of, of the whole series. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, so yeah, I think um, see so yeah, probably the next uh, uh, thing is a kind of an overview of like the the tech and um, the architecture and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. Okay. And kind so, of what serverless and Jamstack mean. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Here's some. Um, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So for those of you that are newer to serverless or Jamstack, Netlify 11 E, I have a few like really brief intros and slides so that. Um, you can get an idea of what's going on without necessarily having to understand the full thing. So serverless architecture is characterized by applications that are broken up into different individual functions. Um, so instead of like a full backend, you would just have functions that you hit like API routes. They're hosted by a third party service and they can be scaled individually. And a bunch of vendors have function code. Um, for example, AWS have, has Lambda, which is actually the backbone of Netlify functions. Um, and then there's um, Azure has functions. I forget what they're called <laughs> and Google Cloud Platform, but all of them have different function um, ways to build functions. Um, they can be invoked and scaled individually. And what I really love is that there's no need for server management by the developer because there's so many things to know in front end development, full stack development these days that like adding DevOps to that list is, you know, it's just a lot. So it's really nice to be able to kind of hand that off and it just works. Um, you might've heard the word Jamstack. Um, Jamstack and serverless are pretty tightly intertwined, um, but Jamstack is a modern web development architecture based on client-side JavaScript, reusable APIs and pre-built markup. So what does that kind of look like? Um, this is a picture I stole from Netlify, but um, You'll have a high performance <laughs> static front end. So your HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, and any other assets. And those are pre-built. Um, so you have a build system, CI, CD, and we usually pre-build those for performance. So we don't have a server waiting for um, a request to come in to then render the page. We have them pre-built waiting to just serve up. And then we reach for APIs, which can be, for example, Stripe or Lambdas, which are functions and other things to perform any backend type things that we need. Oh, I'm so used to clicking other keys when I have slides. <laughs> so in this particular app, what are those major players? Um, the tech and the APIs that we're gonna use. Well, first off, I'm a big fan of Eleventy, and that is a static site generator. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, GitHub, of course, um, that's going to be where uh, the code is hosted on the web. And then I'm going to use Netlify, which does a lot of different things. Here we're going to use it for static site hosting and serverless functions, um, and also for ho holding my um, environment variables, like my secrets. And then um, Stripe is where we're going to put our products, um, and it will handle checkout and it will also email payment receipts. And of course, Stripe does a lot more than that, but that's mostly, and webhooks. <laughs> We're gonna, um, but it can do even more than that. And then AWS and SendGrid are what I'm using for fulfillment. And um, so with AWS, it's gonna use an S3 bucket. And it's okay if you don't know what all these things mean, I'll mention a bit more about them later. Um, but that's what gives me my signed URLs, those unique expiring URLs. And then SendGrid I'm using for um, the email part to send it to the customer after they purchase something. So this first episode is all about really build and deploy, listing those products, getting the products out of Stripe um, and rendering them. So um, what does that look like if I were to draw it out? Um, well, this is, I wanted to mention pre-built static pages again, because uh, a lot of people will get tripped up on this if they're not used to serverless or static site building. But what we're doing is we're using, you can use like a lot of different frameworks. These are just some of the popular ones. Elemity is the one that I'm using, but like Next.js can do pre-built um, or static builds. Uh, Gatsby is popular for that if you're a React person, both of those. 
Um, Jekyll is kind of the older school Ruby based way of doing this. Um, Nux review, Hugo, there's, there's a bunch of different ones. Um, and so when we look at this architecture, this is how it looks for like the total build process. I have my laptop and my code, whenever I push it to GitHub, whenever you um, create a new site in Netlify and link it to GitHub, it will automatically create this webhook for you so that whenever the main branch changes or you have a PR, it can do a deploy preview. It will trigger a build and deploy. And then during that build and deploy, my 11 e code says, hey, I need to get some prices and products from Stripe through its Stripe API. And then, of course, Stripe sends it back and Netlify finishes the build using 11 e What's also cool is that Netlify can host my environment variables. And then I can use, sorry, my dog, my dog is very grunty. So if you hear exasperated sighs in the background, it's her, not me. Um, but Netlify can hold my environment variables. And um, then I use the Netlify CLI when, on my laptop, which actually pulls them in there. So it kind of keeps them secret, which is nice. Um, so there's always like weird having environment variables in both dev and production. Um, so <laughs> thanks, CJ. Um, all right. I think that's, yeah, we were going to pause there and back to you, Matt. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's brilliant. I'm, uh, I lo I loved this um, this build out. It's like, really exciting to learn so much about Eleventy and um, and serverless functions. Um, maybe like let's pause. Uh, any questions up till now about um, about the the system, about the tech, about anything at all? Thanks, CJ, about the nice graphs as well. I think you're absolutely right. They look amazing. <laughs> <laughs> my my hand drawn one graph. <laughs> I know there's That's a bit so cool. of delay between like real time and when YouTube gets it. So our, our questions might be a little delayed. Okay. Okay. No worries. I mean, like we're uh, anyway, you can just like post your questions if you have them um, in, into the channel. Um, and uh, we'll try we'll, to catch we'll just, them. <laughs> yeah, we'll, 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 we'll check and, and try to address them as we go. And um, so I think maybe like I'll, I'll just speak very briefly about um, products and prices um, at, at Stripe and kind of talk about maybe some of the main features. Um, and things you can do with them. Uh, so let's, uh, let me share this one. So in the dashboard under products, uh, makes sense. You can do things like adding a product. Um, here we'll see like the, you know, the, the usual suspects, um, a name description and an optional image. Um, and you can pull that, all of that data, including the image back from the API and then display it on, on your page. Here, these are, these uh, placeholders are actually pretty, <clears throat> pretty well thought out because um, a product can be, um, you know, a one-time product like a coffee cup or sunglasses, but it can also be um, a, a plan of a subscription because um, at Stripe, you're, you can model really complex, um, or not complex, but like sophisticated uh, pricing uh, pricing structures um, for your business. So here we can see inline in the same uh, um, in the same UI, you can create your first price for this particular product. So when we think about products and prices. The product is the what you're selling, and then the price is how you're selling it, right? So, um, for example, you can have multiple prices for a product, and if initially you might think, oh, that's a bit strange, but it um it actually enables you to do lots of really cool stuff. Like you can act, you can sell uh for a certain amount of USD into the US market, or you can sell for a certain a different amount of euros um and create prices with different currencies into the European market, which um which makes all the sense when you think about it. So here is here we can see well, I think CS certainly is probably going to use a one-time price to sell a digital download for a certain amount for a certain currency. Um, and then, of course, if you uh, see if you wanted to start a subscription service, right, where you send out like your newest print every month or your newest art, uh, uh, rather um, designs uh, every month, then you might uh, 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 opt for a recurring uh, price and then bill over a, a bill uh, in a recurring um, uh, recurring uh, every uh, uh, in a certain cadence, right? Um, finally, worth touching upon is that there are different pricing models that you can use uh, for your prices. So standard pricing would be like a flat fee, so 10 bucks for uh, a coffee cup, uh, package pricing for when you're selling things that are more than one in packages, and then graduated in volume where you can have things like non-linear pricing structures um, for, um, for, for modeling things where uh, pri a pricing where uh, the price changes over uh, depending on the usage of the product or the quantity of the product bought. So 
a, a lot to, to kind of uh, to, to, to digest there. Um, I won't create a price here. I'm going to wait till I'm going to hand over to see it to like really create a, a proper price. Um, and then I'll also uh, call out really importantly um, payment links, um, uh, uh, which uh, which we'll see uh, on on one of the one of the designs that C is going to manage. All right. Um, so yeah, you want to share my screen? Yeah. All right. All right. So I have to. I want to bump up the the, res, the the zoom on that a couple of notches. Oh, um, for me. Oh yeah, yeah. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. I think. There you go. All right. Nice. So I have two products in there that we already put in there to um, test things out, but we'll go ahead and add another one so you can see what we're doing here. So first off, I'll give I'll give it a name. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. I just like copying things. So this is a previous one I did, but now we'll have my bigger coloring pages pack. Um, and then... <laughs> I'm going to copy this over because, you know, you don't want to wait for me to do that. I am, I will say I did something when you weren't looking yesterday. I actually, <laughs> I used, um, I switched to Cloudinary for my image hosting so that I could do like multiple things and it's a whole nother topic altogether. So I might just have this image handy can get it um sampler all right um so it would be kind of cool if you could um do some image manipulation here uh, you know on the stripe side to make it easier for folks to make them optimal i'm a performance engineer too so i'm always worried about that so my tax code, I've been calling these digital images. Um, there's a lot of different things you can go through here, but I think digital image characterizes what this is best. Um, now, so maybe I'll just speak to that just very briefly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so your tax code, that's part of um, the, the new Stripe tax, uh, or at least it, it, it's used as part of the new Stripe tax um, product that was released, I think, just last year. Um, and so if you set a tax code for your product, uh, that will actually be picked up <clears throat> by Stripe Tax, depending on where the um, your, your customer is. So let's say uh, in Ireland, digital images are taxed at a different rate than somewhere else. When I put in my uh, uh, my, my billing address, Stripe Tax will automatically tell me, aha, um, I'm going to tax you at a certain rate in Ireland um, for a digital image. Now, there is also the concept of a default tax code, which you can set up in the dashboard in the settings. So let's say, CA, like you always sell, sell oh, digital nice. images. You could just mm -hmm. set up like your default tax code and then you would never need to manage it again at the product level. But it is, of course, like really useful if you sell lots of different types of things, right? So you might want to like yeah, set up yeah. those tax codes. Yeah, so definitely worth, worth kind of calling that out. That's really cool. That's cool. All right. And so I clicked on these additional options, which I don't need these so much as I need the metadata because this is how I'm going to um, pair up. I have my downloads inside of S3. These are all the files. This is a private S3 bucket. So no one can directly access the, these files. But um, when I do my signed URL request, I'm going to ask for you know a temporary um, URL for those to work right, but I still need to link them up. So um, I need to add some metadata in order to make that link happen. So I'm basically using Stripe as my database to ho host my product information, and I'm adding a bit more information to do some things. So this is the name of the file that's linked to this particular product. And then um, I have this this is what I added yesterday. <laughs> this is actually a key to my Cloudinary image um, dashboard, like the image that is this image so that I can do image manipulation. And then um, in the future, I also want to make categories so that I can add my crochet patterns and other things and then organize them a bit more. So I have coloring pages as a category. Oops, I zoomed in a lot for some reason. That was weird. <laughs> All right, the pricing model is standard. This is one ninety nine because you know super expensive coloring pages. Um, it's only a one time charge. This is not a subscription. That would be kind of fun to do, but it's not a subscription. Um, and I think that's all I actually need to do in this. I'm not including the tax in the final price. 
and I only have one price. Anything I missed there? It looks great. All right, let's save product. And we have our product. And we see we have three products listed here. So maybe it's a, that'd be a good chance just to <clears throat> kind of show how payment links might work here. So let's say for the sake of argument, oh, have I got, I'm not muted, sorry. Let's say the sake of argument, you wanted to like um, just get going really quickly with your business and you didn't want to build you know, a, a, a complex checkout process. So if you'd like click through and on the pricing, uh, you should see under prices, you should see there create a payment link. And if you click on that, what you'll get is a preview of what the user would see if they receive that link and click on it. They would be like sent straight into checkout. Um, and payment links are getting more and more sophisticated. So you can do things like add promo codes. You can collect addresses, um, and it just lets you get get you know get up and running with with, uh, with receiving payments really really quickly. So when you created that link, you know you'll get the link and you can share that in email, messenger uh, services, and just pretty much anywhere you can post a link. And um, so that would have been an, another option as well. But I think uh, it's just worth pointing out that it's it's that's there. It's really simple to get started. Um, um yeah but i think we're you're going to uh, integrate um kind of with a proper checkout session object let's say yeah cool that's really awesome actually so mm -hmm. i definitely want to use this for some things on my other websites <laughs> nice nice um awesome so i think we were going to dive into the code at this point yep makes sense all right um so Actually, do you mind switching to the slides for a second so I can oh, give first. a brief intro of Eleventy? Um, so Eleventy is the stack site generator I'm using. I just wanted to give you a general idea of how it works so that you know in your mind how to convert it to whatever you're using as your front end. Um, it, I like it. It's a node-based static site generator, so a little bit like Jekyll, but it's now Node instead of Ruby. Um, it's non-corporate and open source, and it requires no client-side JavaScript, which I'm a big fan of because I'm always worried about performance. It has a folder or file-based API, which a lot of these products do. I work, I've worked in React a lot in the past, and so um, it's kind of similar to both Next.js and Gatsby in that regard. Um, I can't speak to some of the others. You can use Markdown, Liquid, Nunjux, Pug, Handlebars, and a lot more out of the box. Those are um, templating languages. And of course, Markdown is kind of like HTML. So that's cool. If you want to learn more about um, Eleventy, I have a tutorial I wrote. And this is, you know, like a <laughs> small tutorial just to get you a flavor of it. And then um, you can go from there. I forgot what slide is next. Oh, yeah, that's for later. Um, so I'll drop that link. If you just go to Sia.codes and look for this possum with a microphone, you'll find it. Sorry, the possum is the mascot of Eleven E, so you'll see a lot of ridiculous pictures like that <laughs> from the Eleven E dev community. <laughs> um, awesome. So let me get back in the code. So we'll switch back to my computer. All right. Thank you. Um, Wait, why does it think? <laughs> I was like, I guess I accidentally closed this out earlier. So when I, whenever I open a new repo, I always look at the package JSON to kind of understand what's going on here. So you can understand what dependencies I already have. Now, almost all of them are dev dependencies because remember this is pre-built. So at build time is when we're generating all of our pages. So, um, these are 11E dependencies. I'm using Luxon for some date stuff. This is also for 11E to do some more markdown things. Um, we'll talk about this plugin later when we get to that. And then I have node fetch because when I do requests in 11E um, at build time, we're actually using node. So I need fetch. Although I think now it's in node live. I need to figure out which version that is, <laughs> which is exciting. And then I have Stripe as well. Um, and then you see, so all these are dev dependencies. I do have some non-dev dependencies, and these are the ones that I'll use in my serverless function later on. Actually, Lodash can actually be up here. And I don't even know if I use Lodash. Um, luckily, none of these dependencies are ending up on the front end, which is really cool. Um, so they're just things to use at build time. All right. So this is... <laughs> This is a bigger 11E project, so you don't worry about like you know all the files that are going on here. What I will say is that in my source folder, I have um, 
So for example, this is my homepage and this is called YAML Front Matter. And so it tells me to use this particular layout and it gives it some tags and it has a date. Um, but that's generally how a page is created inside of um, inside of Elemony. And what I why don't we go ahead and do? Um, remember, I said I'm using Netlify on the command line, so you can if you just type Netlify, I think it will give you once you have it installed the Netlify CLI, it will tell you all the commands you have access to. There's actually a short version of the whole word Netlify which I'll use. So I'm just gonna do NTL dev is to run my dev server. And what we'll see here, I'm going to do this so it doesn't keep scrolling. <laughs> it already loaded up. Um, you see how it injected my build settings. These are all stored in the Netlify UI, and I'll kind of show how that works later on. But it's really awesome. So all my keys are just ready and waiting for me to use. Um, and I don't need to have like a .m file or anything like that. And then um, it does um, MPX Elemity serve, and I'll show you where that's set up. And then it, this is all Elemity stuff. It's just saying it wrote all those files to my um, my build folder. And so, wait, what did I say I was going to talk about? <laughs> I already forgot. Oh, the Netlify Tommel. Um, so these are the things you need to understand. The Netlify Tommel is what tells Netlify some of the things to do. So right now, these are the things I have set up. Whenever I run Netlify dev, it's going to run npm run start, which if we look then at my package JSON is really just um, mpx 11 dash dash serve. So that's what Netlify dev is doing, but it's injecting all the things that Netlify has access to so that when I run it in dev, it's like running it in prod as well or during build. I also have this here, these are my production commands. So my production build runs npm run build. This is a functions folder, which we're not using yet today. We'll do that next time. Um, and then my publish folder is underscore site. So that's like my build folder. <laughs> Did you hear my dog sneeze? That was like a massive sneeze. Yeah, that was very audible. <laughs> <laughs> he was like across the room too. My little dude. Um, you gonna make a cameo? Okay, come here. <laughs> This I won't say the W A L K uh, like last time. Yeah, I word. know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Thank you for helping. You're so helpful. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So that was kind of how it all works together. And um, we can see I ran Netlify Dev. So I'm on localhost. And, you know, I have the other pages. But then I had this shop page, which is not actually built yet. This is my 404 page. So we need to build this shop page. So in order to do that, I go here in my source folder and I create a file called um, shop.njk. Njk is for nunjux. So I'm using JavaScript templating using nunjux. Um, here's, you don't know what I'm actually saying out loud. Nunjux. Um, all right, so I have some code I'm going to copy paste over here uh, so that we don't spend all our time <laughs> waiting. Um, so I'm gonna copy paste my YAML front matter. So these are the things telling Elevity what to do with this file. It's saying use this layout, um, give it this title tag. Um, I mean, which is actually set up elsewhere. And then it has a nav tag and some other stuff. And what I wanna do here is um we'll go ahead and copy some of this other stuff in here it won't work yet but i can write regular html in here and um it would work but i'm actually just going to go ahead and um, paste in what i need these are <laughs> these are this is setting some variables it's saying the intro heading is title set intro summary there's no intro sum but summary um, and then content it's saying to dump in the content and this says include an a partial um, so my intro nunjuck so it's kind of like a um, if you're not used to working with templates it's kind of like a component but it's written all in HTML instead and um, also this one so these are two different um, partials that we're including so if I save that none of it's going to work yet because I don't have some well, some of it will work different parts of it. Well, actually it might totally break. Let's see what's going on down here. Nope, it's not broken. 
But if I refresh, yeah, we have our intro, but nothing's down here because we don't actually have, we haven't pulled in our prices yet, right? And the way I can do that, or the way I can see what's data is being in here, is being in here, is in here, is <laughs> I can do this function called uh, prices and then log. Um, so what this is, it's using a filter called log that's actually native in either Nunjax or Levendi. I forget which one. And um, filters are just functions. It's just weird that it's backwards. The first argument is always first, and then the pipe, and then the name of the function. <laughs> it's weird. I can't explain that. But if I do that, it's, it's I'm looking for global data called prices inside of Eleventy. And if I save this, nothing's going to happen yet because I have no prices, um, mm -hmm. which I actually don't know where it would be. It might be up here, but it's probably like undefined. Yep, yeah, undefined. So now we need to actually pull that data in for any of this to work. So I have um, this magical um, file called underscore data, and that's where my um, global data is. Uh, I didn't show you this yet, but um, global data is pretty awesome. There's this whole um, data, oh gosh, what's it called? <laughs> Hierarchy inside of um, Eleventy, which is really cool. So some data you can add via YAML, you can, and you can add other data in other ways. But here we're going to add a global data thing called prices and um um matt not to put you on the spot but do you want to talk about maybe why we started with prices that's supposed to be changing. yeah absolutely not. um so the way that the like the the api is is um you you can query for products um and then uh, uh query for prices but it actually is like slightly more efficient to do it the other way around is to query for prices and then we use a technique called expansion um, uh, response expansion um, to actually expand the uh, expand the products based on the product ID on the price. So what you can do is you can effectively query for price and say, also give me every pro the product to which this price um, belongs. And this works perfectly for it, it, in this case because uh, CS products and prices are like one to one. So you effectively get um, you know you get the product uh, embedded in the price. But it would be pretty simple if you wanted to uh, query for prices and um, expand the products and then, you know, maybe iterate over uh, the response and then kind of like rehash um, the product to the price, basically. Um, yeah, so I would definitely maybe I can grab a link on. We have a whole series on expansion in our YouTube channel. Um, it's really cool because um, you can basically make your uh, you can really simplify your code because you don't have to um, make as many API queries. And I can also speed things up because you're getting all the data kind of like um, eagerly loaded in a way um, with your with your queries. Uh, let's see here. I'll just like, I'll just post one of them. And maybe it's, isn't in a playlist. Let me see here. Do, do, do. Uh, if I can find a playlist. Well, if not, you, you could you'll find it pretty simply. But I'll post a link to um, to expanding in Ruby. Uh, post a comment. All right, if I post it here, there you go. That's how to like expand um, expand uh, things in responses uh, using Ruby. So you can do cool things like you can expand uh, expand in a list. So let's say um, you know you're listing prices. Um, actually, I think that's what we are going to do in this case, right? Like if you're listing prices, you can say, give me every product, you know, um, effectively embedded in the price response and based, you know, it, it, nearly, it basically looks it up a little bit like a foreign key and then embeds it in the response. Um, and then you can also like do uh, within reason, <laughs> you can do uh, multiple jumps, right? So you could like uh, if, a pro if a product had uh, a foobar, you could uh, say, hey, give me for every price, give me the product and its foobar, and it will actually bundle all of the um, the responses together into into one JSON response. So it can get pretty pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, thanks for that. While he was giving you that, I started with a little bit of fancier things for environment because for me, <laughs> managing environment variables can be annoying if I don't start doing it ahead of time. But um, there's two things going on here. First, I'm grabbing process.m.context. This is not something I set. This is something that's in Netlify. Um, so if you just Google Netlify and process.m.context, you'll see a bit more about it. But there's different contexts. There's production, there's dev, there's deploy previews. There's all sorts of contexts you can have. And so because a lot of um, systems like Stripe, they'll have a different, you'll have a test key but then you also have like your live production key. So once your 
once you're ready to actually deploy, something like this would be handy. So I thought I'd show it as um, as a way to manage those keys. You don't have to do this right away. Right away, you should probably just do the test key only until you're definitely ready to deploy to production. But so now this says, just giving me the right Stripe API key. So then I can instantiate Stripe and say Stripe equals require. And this is um, node. That's why we're using require instead of imports. Um, so we're going to require Stripe. And then we immediately give it the API key. So it's like an immediately invoked function. Right? Did I say that right? <laughs> Matt, <laughs> I'm like, you should check what I'm saying. I'm, I'm the Rubyist in the room. You'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> I was originally you're you're on your own. <laughs> um, all right, so that's just, now we have Stripe ready and waiting um, with our key. So we should be able to use all the Stripe functions. Um, and the way I need to pull, or I guess, inject this data into Eleventy is an async way, because right, this is an, we're actually doing a fetch during the build, which is going to be async. So I need to do an async function, async function, get prices we'll call it get prices i don't actually have any params i need here um and what we'll do here is say const response equals um await stripe dot prices dot list and this is where we do that expand thing that um matt was talking about so expand Data dot product. So we're requesting prices and then saying also include the products for each price, which sounds a little bit weird, but that's how it works. <laughs> um, so we've awaited that. And um, then I'm going to return from this function the response dot data dot filter. And I added this filter because if you um, if you archive a price, it will still show up in the list um, unless you kind of filter out the things that aren't active. And the way I do that is just filtering for price.active. Active is a Boolean um, data property on the um, price element. So that's our function, but we need to actually do something with it. So I'm going to do module.x. Whoa. VS Code got a little too excited there. Um, module.exports um, equals async function, no name, no params, and we're going to return await get prices. All right, so that should work. Hopefully, cross fingers, live coding is always interesting, <laughs> even if we have a reference. Um, one thing to add here is we need to like uh, we should eventually add a try catch. <laughs> so I'm gonna just put that to do in here, you know, because you know if things go wrong. Then I mean, it's not as you would probably notice right away because it's during the build step. It's not when like someone requests something. So, but we'll still put it in here. Um, catch errors. Oh, <laughs> uh, so yeah. So let's let's see if this worked. Um, it might have already reloaded. Did it reload with data? It did, because remember, I had this handy dandy. Um, where is it? it? Oh, in shop. I had this handy daddy log thing. So what's cool here, because remember, this is we're doing pre built pages. So this isn't a log on the command line in the browser, it's a log in our server, which is not like a live server, but it's our server. And so it's here on my, um, in, in my terminal. So let's go to here and look, they all magically appeared because <laughs> um, the server was waiting and watching for changes. So, wow, we have our three products. That's a little too, e a little too easy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I didn't show, I had already built a template to actually hold these products. I will show that really fast since, you know, I, I think we're running on time. Okay. Um, yeah. So 
prices is a global thing. We know that now because prices just appears and it's called prices because I called the file prices. It's just kind of magical. Um, it's really amazing. Um, and when I set, um, so it's just available globally. And then here I said include intro in JK, which is really just this bar at the top, the masthead. And then product list is what is actually rendering those prices. So if I look at product list, it's um, first I'm checking to see if there are any because um, I don't want it to get angry because there aren't any. And we can see a lot of HTML and classes set, but we have our H2 for products. And now this is in Nunjux, this is a loop. So for price and prices, um, now I can refer to each individual price as a price. I'm going to give it the product name, the description, and then I have this um, hidden input, which is that price that ID, which comes from Stripe. Um, so if, actually, part of the reason why I logged this, because, you know, I like to see what data I'm working with when I'm building out a front end. So this is an individual price. It has that ID, which is something we're going to need um, from Stripe. Wait, do we need the product ID? Yeah, the price ID. Mm -hmm. and the other things. Remember I said there was that active attribute on here. So you, actually there might be some archive ones in here. Yep. You see, oh, never mind. I don't know where it is. It's fine. <laughs> but anyways, all of our data is in there. So you can see the data that I can pull out and pull into here. So I have this hidden input with price ID, and then this is a form. So we're doing like old school HTML here. Um, Although API is not going to work, so I didn't, I don't have that redirect set up, so I need to change that because we don't. <laughs> this isn't going to work yet because this was the end of what we planned to do in this episode, but it's kind of a preview of I'm going to have an action that's going to go to my serverless function and it's going to send this price ID input um, when yeah. when a user clicks a button. But anyways, I got ahead of myself. Oh, and then the price dot unit dot amount, and this is another filter. Um, you remember I said it's like first you put the param and then the pipes and then the filter name. And so I'm converting those cents to dollars there. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, Sorry. Dan is like old school. I was like, yes, <laughs> I know. Me too. I'm like, because all the, you know, it's funny. I've done serverless functions before, but I've done them all not this way. I've done them all doing fetch from the front end. And I'm like, that's kind of silly because a form will just do it for you. So that's what we're going to do. So you can see it the old school way because there's no javascript really required to to send yeah stuff. um but yeah anyways yeah yeah that's super good and that was one thing that you like that that you know you taught me about serverless functions that at least on netlify you know you can you can take care of the redirect there too so like yeah as long as you have that form and you can post it up you can absolutely um yeah, like you don't have to like necessarily get a, a checkout set. Like the old school way would be like to get a checkout session ID back from the Stripe API. Um, in this case, then return it from the serverless function and then call redirect to checkout, you know, in in um, in JavaScript on the uh, on the front end. But like, hey, you don't even need to do that anymore. You can just like re redirect directly from the from the serverless function. That kind of blew my mind. Yeah. I forgot um, what we're gonna do next. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know. Let's see. Are there oh, any questions? Guess? Any yeah. questions up up till now? Um, uh, like I can I can maybe uh, ask like so what what was your kind of I, I I built a very simple like my dev page in in Leventy. I was like curious. I think I think I like asked Thor and a bunch of other folks at Stripe like tell me like a new stack I should I should tinker with and it was Netlify and and um and Leventy. But like it's the most simple thing ever. Um, like how long have you been, how long have you been actually working with Leventy and, and like, cause this is obviously, you're obviously got in some really sophisticated. I know, right. I don't know. It's been a while now. I've built so many pages in it and it's funny. Cause you know, I loved, um, I learned Angular a while back, but it never stuck. And then I learned react and I really like the idea of components and thinking in that way and developing mm -hmm. the front end. Um, but, um, on the side, I feel like it's a little too much. Like you don't necessarily need a huge JavaScript framework for something that really can just be a static page, like a blog, mm -hmm. for example, or um, a shop. And um, it's not to knock anything. If you have an actual complicated app, then it's totally appropriate to use a full, um, a full blown framework like that. But mm -hmm. for the most part, we don't. And so um, I started mm -hmm. tinkering with the Lemony for I, probably for my blog first. And then um, 
started building that out. And it was funny. I kind of liked front end again, even though like a lot of um, people who've worked in frameworks will probably balk at doing that, like going back to like HTML templates and stuff. But it was like, I learned CSS better and I just started fun. So now I've like, I built all these random pages. Um, if you want to share my screen for a second, I'm going to show you this silly. Absolutely. So I, um, <laughs> this yeah. was not planned, but then I was like, oh, this is actually a great one. So this is silly. This is my board game shelf because when I lived in New Orleans, I didn't have enough space to have my games on a, on a, like a bookshelf, like most people would do. So I just stashed them in weird places, but then we needed to figure out what game we wanted to play when we had game night. So I built this page <laughs> and it uses, um, board game geek, but then I render it myself. And it's like, when you click on a particular game, it gives you that game info and all the description and. This is all using 11D and um, 11D pagination. So if you have global data, you can then paginate that data to create multiple pages. So um, that's what okay. this is doing. It has a global games element, and then it creates a page for every item, which is kind of fun. So, Super um, cool. So we do have oh, a question from yeah. Zerius PH. So uh, we, we might need a bit of info, but like, the question, I can like pop it up here. It's like, yeah. so do you need a developer to compile these into HTML? And it's like a follow-up part. Um, for example, like our marketing guys can't just update the website Ooh, by himself. That's a good question. So I think what you're getting at is, okay, yeah, I, I understand the question now. So you can also use a headless CMS with 11 -E. Um, Not to be like, I feel like I'm selling 11 -E now, but um, <laughs> this is true for a lot of frameworks too. So you can take this information elsewhere. But for example, I'm a co-organizer for the 11 -E meetup. And um, this is our website, which is built with 11 -E. And um, but we use a CMS because I have um, my co-organizers and we also have like, you know, some set things we need from every speaker. So it was just easier to set up something that's actually a CMS. Um, so I can actually show you because this is. Like, I don't think you'll see any secrets here, so it's fine. <laughs> So this is, I'm just showing you as an example, because I feel like seeing an example is easier than like just explaining it to you. So you can see we have like a person here. So like all the our speakers that have talked and then we have a talk. So it's like your standard CMS. You have different data elements and I can write in rich text here. Um, I can have links and other stuff. Um, it's cool. And then whenever I save something over here, it has a webhook also that triggers a rebuild and then it rebuilds our site. So you can see all of our events are actually based on that. And then the event details and it has all this information. Here's like the speaker details. So you can set up a CMS so that people who are non-developers can also edit data as well. I don't Super cool. Yeah. Something I also didn't know. Yeah, cause I'm still, I'm pretty sure I'm still using Markdown. Yeah, and me like, too. Like, like for myself, yeah. that's what I do. Like my blog is all, I love Markdown. My blog is actually more, <laughs> so, sorry, this is a really old blog that's in this one, but in my coding blog, I should show that instead. Um, uh, oh yeah, actually here's some sample ones. Um, but mm -hmm. you can just write in Markdown, which I love Markdown because, you know, each one of these is a paragraph, but you don't have to have the paragraph tag. And yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And code samples, it's actually perfect for a coding blog because you always need these code samples and, you know, you want your syntax highlighting to match the language that you're using. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Really, really cool. Okay. Um, Dan says, uh, I found marketing folks have loved Cloud Canon too, so they can see the changes without having to build vision. Oh, cool. Yeah, there's some, um, there's some tools you can do nice. for that too. I haven't done that yet, but um, I also haven't had to deal with a lot of non-technical people for this part. <laughs> but there's so many cool things you can do. Um, there's also 11 serverless, so you don't necessarily have to build out every single page right away, but that's that's a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, let's keep it out. We've got about, we, I mean, we've got quite quite through a lot, uh, got through quite a lot of information there. And, We'll wait for a couple more questions, maybe. But in the meantime, maybe we like just recap what um, what what we covered uh, in this particular session. So, I guess we start today just describing that you know your your product catalog um, is a really important thing to manage. You can manage that on Stripe. You can uh, decorate your products and your prices with your own metadata. And um, so, if you wanted to, for example, link a particular product or a price back to your own database, 
um, you know, you could you could quite happily um, or quite easily store your own IDs on those products and prices, which a lot of people like to do. For example, customer IDs, right? If you have a customer, um, then you can you can um, store your own database customer ID on the customer and have a linkage there. Um, nevertheless, I'm getting off track. Uh, products and, and prices. Um, you can use prices to model lots of different types of how of ways that you sell your products, right? So whether they're you know recurring um, and build at a certain cadence, or whether they're one-time payments, um, and you can use those prices to generate payment links, right? So you could like um, get kick off your business with no code whatsoever and just send out payment links, um, and then um, and then see. Obviously, you know, uh, did an incredible. <laughs> A job at integrating simply um, with uh, Eleventy using Stripe Node uh, to query uh, to query back from the API, um, yeah, and using using re a really nice uh, product or a rather response expansion uh, for for actually getting the products in a list um, in a, in a list query uh, to the Stripe API. So that's like really really handy. Um, I guess like we should tease. I, I think. Not, we won't build anything, I don't think, Sia, but like, let's speak about maybe just what's coming up next week, Thursday, I want to say. Um, uh, do you want to say a few words or shall I, shall I uh, waffle on about it a bit? <laughs> it's totally <laughs> up to you. Um, and we got eight minutes. I could even attempt to like, you know. Do you want to try? Should we go for it? We should at least user. hit the uh, serverless function. Why don't we try let's to do that? Use serverless function. Yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. So, um. In my Netlify Tamil, I have um, declared a functions folder called functions. Um, I think in the docs, it defaults to like dot net or Netlify slash. Um, there's already a dot Netlify folder in your file once you add um, your stuff. So I personally get confused if it's like dot Netlify slash Netlify. So I always rename it to just functions because it's like all too much for me. So I have this functions folder. It's currently empty. And what's going to happen here is it's basically like our API, but it's an internal. It's like as if we had a server, we'll hit these um, routes. Um, I forgot what, actually what we call this. Let me look over and open that one up so we don't get too. Uh, I don't write too much bad code for you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to make a new file called um, create checkout session.js. These are all JavaScript because we're using Node. Um, and then, which I don't have like my spiel out yet, but for a um, serverless function in Netlify, I said it uses AWS in the background, but they have a standard way of setting them all up. And you do exports.handler equals async function. And we don't have a name. Um, and the params are always event and context. You don't have to use them, but those are the standard ones that come with Netlify serverless functions. And so for the basic part of this, um, what you absolutely must do is return um, uh, status code. Oops, this needs to be an object. So we want to return a status code of, let's say 200 is okay. Um, and then you can return a body. And this is a part I'd actually, <laughs> I don't have like the hello world ones uh, up here, but I think it would be like json.stringify. And then like, you could say something like, you know, hello world, which I guess that doesn't really need. Oh wait, yeah, here we go. And message is hello world. So something like that, like you, mm -hmm. like your data would, you would probably have data that's an object and you would have something like a message in there. Um, <laughs> I think this will work. <laughs> this is our hello that world. That looks good for my memory. Um, and then I'm gonna do the, the fetch from the front end just so we see what's going on without doing the form yet and then like next week we'll we'll go ahead and add in the prices or actually try to get the price out of the mm -hmm. request um so what i'm going to do is on my shop page just basically when the shop loads i'm going to run this script so it's not it's not realistic but we just want to see that um what we're doing is working so we want to um fetch um and then this is the folder route um so it's 
dot netlify which is very confusing because it's not dot netlify locally um but it's dot netlify slash functions slash purchase create checkout session mm -hmm. without the dot js we don't need that and then um we'll do a dot then um response response dot json and then dot then we have json and then we'll just console log it if you don't know this trick um this is kind of nice because we'll see literally an object called json and then what's in the json an object with a property called json Mm -hmm. I have no idea if this worked because we are live coding something that I actually <laughs> don't have code in front of me either. Let's see what happened. It should have already refreshed. So let's see what's in the console. Look, there's an object. Ah, oh, look at that. It wow. worked. That's rad. So awesome, right? <laughs> You're like a w one take wonder. You like zero bugs coding. Like this is incredible. <laughs> It doesn't always happen, but when the coding gods smile upon me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. So I think that's a really, really good teaser keyed up now for next next Thursday. Um, and we'll we'll go we'll go into like um oh sorry I I, I hid that um and we'll go into a lot more detail yeah about like all of the f uh, fancy things you can do with checkout um uh to to optimize you know your payments flow and increase conversions and all that all that good stuff. So I think, yeah, like if you, um, let's say, let's uh, let's kind of wrap it up. Um, firstly, thank you so much, Sia, for an incredible integration. That's like really, really, really cool. Um, and I suppose, folks, if I you have any to thank questions... you though, because like you know, you helped me out a lot along the way. Yeah, and... no worries. Like, it was, it was... <laughs> I'm glad. No, I'm glad that our, our little collaboration on on building out the thing like turned into some live streams, and and we can we can do. And you're you know you're a great teacher, so it makes makes perfect sense. Um, so I'd say like if there's any questions, of course you can find Sia at well the Green Greek is right there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm at MattlingDev underscore Dev. You can reach out to us anyway. Um, on Stripe Dev on Twitter. Um, there's also the Stripe Discord. Us. Um, there's a Stripe oh, Discord, yeah. and there's an Eleventy Discord. Um, Let me post the Stripe Discord uh, link. One second. And I've got I will... it as a shortcut somewhere. I'll post the 1181 directly on YouTube too, in case yeah, you are so, interested in building with it. Yeah, so you can join in the conversation there. Um, and otherwise, yeah, really looking forward to uh, to next week to see see how things progress. Uh, please join us. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining this time too. All right. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, y'all.